Greetings, everyone. It's CM Kozaman again with a previously unseen format. Today, we have none other than PK Sivgin on our interview. Uh, he's also, like me, very interested in paleontology, speculative evolution, and like many of yourselves. So let's hear the introduction from Tolga. Uh, my name is Timur Sivkin. Um... Mm -hmm. No problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, like yeah. I, I currently study uh, history and earth system sciences at the University of Zurich. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, on the side, I work as a research assistant for Dr. Dennis Hansen at the Zoological Museum of Zurich. Mm -hmm. Online, I think I'm mostly known for my blog, Manus Spondylus, where I where I claim that I write about paleontology, but really lately I just write about whatever I want. That's the best kind of yeah. writing. And recently I also started a speculative evolution project with a friend of mine, Bob Guan is his name. Mm -hmm. It's called mm -hmm. Rhinia. Yes, I, I've seen it. It's, it's really good. So uh, apologies in advance to you and to our many viewers. Uh, uh, it's my mistake for mistaking TK Sivgin and mistaking the T for uh, Tolga rather than Timur. Timur's Patreon and all other links are in the video description. So for this video, please support him and not me. So, I mean, we've been corresponding with each other for a while. And uh, usually the conversation flows very naturally. I mean, for example, your speculative evolution project, it's very unique. It's about an abandoned gigantic space station with uh, many kinds of habitats inside and for probably like four or five different worlds. So imagine um, six, six mm -hmm. and technically seven, if you count out like the interior of the ship that was not meant to be uh, colonized, but eventually was. So the great secret of that habitat is actually a, a wayward colonization mission that has become its own kind of space drifting Galapagos in a way. Yeah, basically. There was a, there was a science fiction story similar in the 1990s. It was called Marrow, M-A-R-R-O-W. And it was about basically a Jupiter-sized planet, which was actually a spaceship. And in the planet's core, there were many like moon-sized hollows. And all of these were inhabited by different fauna or different species. But uh, the way you expose it, it's more about the nature and evolution of such an habitat. Whereas the science fiction I'm talking you, to you about, named Marrow, the author of which I cannot remember at, at, at the moment, it was more about uh, the race of like nanotechnological godlike post humans inhabiting it but yeah that was like yeah. something nice people can also look up so timur people like us i mean there's you there's me there's many other people all over the world in australia in the philippines in sri lanka it's almost like a global awakening or by another perspective a global disease like because usually these interests in basically natural history and uh, speculative evolution, they develop really independently. They, uh, like your creatures in your speculative evolution project, they develop spontaneously in different countries. Why do you think this is happening in this day and age? Like, you mean that people come up with similar creatures at around the same time? Or... Yes. Also, people are also interested in the same kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, roughly at the same time. Like, let's be honest, in part, it's also plagiarism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like, <laughs> that's, that, for legal reasons, that's a joke. Yes. Like, I mean, I don't like that. There is, of course, like convergent evolution and there is parallel evolution. And mm -hmm. sometimes people are presented with like the same basics and can still from that developed kind of the same idea because they were given the same start, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sort of. Yes. So, I, I personally think it's got to do with the way we can reach information. And I think like this stuff was always very interesting, but uh, like two generations ago, you could only read about it in books or in maybe five museums all around the planet. 
Then one generation ago, it was maybe like eight or six different books. And now it's uh, dozens of books and websites and platforms. And I think this thing always had an innate interest. But people who write and plan media always used to think in terms of narratives. But now, as more people wake up to the non-narrative world of the internet, yeah. I think it's mushrooming all over the place. But uh, I would like to ask you another question, the one that I also get a lot of times, which is to say, how do you uh, come up with your ideas and how do you come up with the energy to maintain and carry out those ideas into completion? Because many people have their own speculative evolution projects, but in the worst cases, they kind of run out of energy after maybe making five Instagram posts or they scribble something on their notebooks, doesn't go anywhere. How do you like come up with the idea and sustain it? I, I really want to hear that from that is, you. Yeah, for that to answer, I will first need to clarify that this really is a collaborative project between me and Bob Guan. And Bob, um, he originally came up with the idea of this spaceship that was like colonized by mm -hmm. uh, Devonian life forms. Originally, I think he wanted it to be a, actually a, like a conlang project. And mm -hmm. then it developed into a speculative evolution project. Mm -hmm. So like what I want to be, say by this, uh, I cannot uh, answer for his creatures, like he does most of the placoderms. Mm -hmm. But I have mostly designed, and he later illustrated for me because my art wasn't that good. I were but, like the, not, as, not as you think, I've seen it, it's really good actually. Ah, thank you, you mean the stipling uh, work? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. So like I have I've come up with like the the side creatures mostly like the the for example there was this one animal I came up with the Kriechecht mm -hmm. so obviously I have to give it a German name which is a sarcopterygian mm -hmm. that is like semi aquatic like it's still obviously a fish mm -hmm. but it has already um. Uh, like front limbs adapted to uh, crawl over short distance so and also it has a neck a bit like a uh, tiktalic but with yeah. a neck basically like a uh, tiktalic but uh, it looks more like a gar mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. I, that's the thing the simple idea I had a fish but with like a short neck because most fish don't ah. really have a neck and i don't know like i don't know, like my um my idea like my philosophy sometimes is just like looking at the limitations of some like animal groups and mm -hmm. thinking what if we played around with like this little bit and that and then how like mu how much things just change from that point on now that's a that's a very good idea i mean looking at like, individual groups and uh, working from them yeah it's a like, really nice just playing around with the anatomy even a little bit and then just like how these like cascades into like i you maybe you might have noticed from my blog i'm a big uh, fan of stephen jay gold and yeah yeah, and yeah. especially a wonderful life and his thesis that like all of history is like built on these like contingencies and if you go farther back in time and like like you go back into the Cambrian and accidentally step on a trilobite, you come back and I don't know, like there's like giant snails ruling Africa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, be careful where we step then. Yes, this idea of contingency, Stephen Jay Gold, the, the book, it's a wonderful life. It's actually a, a very inspiring book. It really inspired me too back in the day. And well, that's a very hopeful message, I think. At the their end. basic idea was, I think, like, in the Cambrian period, you had also all of these like non-surviving phylums. Of course, in, in a cladistic sense, it doesn't really matter much. But like only one mistake, or not even mistakes, but like only chance kept one group from succeeding and others from not. Yeah, that's that is the like the the thing that stuck with me the most. That oftentimes we don't actually have. Uh, a good basis to say on why this went extinct and this lived on, even though like in many even modern paleontological texts you see like the uh, descendants. This group died out gradually because it was being outcompeted by the other one. But if you actually look at the data, it's never actually that, that clear. You yeah. know, like the the South American interchange, for example, where North and South America met, 
And many people say like bird, animals like terror birds and stuff, they died out uh, because they had to compete against like saber toothed cats and dogs. But actually like the, the, um, the terror birds did pretty well until one million years ago and went all the way far up into Texas. But also I'm reminded of the extinction of pterosaurs and uh, like their supposed quote unquote yeah. replacement by birds. And it's like every five years, there's a new paper. First they say, oh, well, they, birds really helped them get extinct. Then they say, oh, actually, no, they were like doing quite well and died out randomly. But no one really sure. No one's really sure. Also, it kind of assumes this like different animal clades are like different, basically, uh, Sports medieval teams. houses or yes, yeah, sports teams. Whereas, like uh, in reality, usually there's a lot of competition among um, mm -hmm. species from a same group. But you know, animals species don't like, act with a kind of clade awareness, or or if they did, it would be a vastly different kind of natural history. Yeah, yeah. Like sometimes this idea of you know. Um survival of the fittest and you know, like fierce competition mm. like it gets taken on onto like this like metaphysical level almost yeah like you said like these are like the, these these uh, clades act like empires you know the nations and basically yeah that is something I, in my bachelor's thesis i actually like uh, wrote a bit about that how we like project how we view human history and like project this back into like prehistory onto a whole animal groups. Mm -hmm. And as you see that in like the image, old imagery of dinosaurs of the Cretaceous, how they look like before the dinosaur Renaissance, how like Cretaceous dinosaurs are always like depicted as like these like decrepit and like decaying animals almost. Yeah, yeah. Almost yeah. zombie like to like signal that their rule is coming to an end and like these, the mammals are coming now and you know. Yes, there, and there you see that a lot in like historical images for like the Byzantine Empire. I think it was yes. almost is always uh, similarly depicted to like these old dinosaur reconstructions, like how like they are so opulent and uh, and Baroque extravagant, but also like yeah. too ancient for their own good and like near collapse. Well, that makes us Turks the mammals then. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the the hair. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Well, okay. actually, there was even this theory called evolutionary sensenance or evolutionary. Yeah, yeah, I also wrote about that in the thesis. Yeah, that that was actually a very common idea that, that which surprised me. The British were really big on it. They they used to think that the groups uh, like and the evidence they give uh, even in if you read the Webster's dictionary, which is like this enormous English dictionary. Yeah. It's um uh, in that dictionary they say they probably died out due to evolutionary senescence or senescence. I might be spelling it wrong. Senescence, yeah. Senescence. Because a senex is a senior in Latin. Yeah, and then it's a, and then the, the dictionary says obviously the, the dictionary has a very general view of things, but they say the, some of the final meat-eating species did not have teeth, and some of the final plant-eating species had outsized horns. But it's uh, once again like I mean as if meat eaters were like a kingdom and they had grown up and you know there's this silly like good times create weak man weak man yeah. create <laughs> that kind of there was also like there is also like a, a lot of like eugenic ideas in that because i think the basic uh, hypothesis of racial senescence was that these animal families have existed for so long now that their genetics are have like become deregulated and, and are running wild which is actually kind of silly because I mean anything yeah. that is alive has genes. Yeah, we all go back to like this uh, Luca, this like one cell that goes uh, that lived four yeah. billion years ago. But it's it's uh, quite interesting that there are many assumptions that people just go with, even in contemporary paleontology. Like, are there any others you could name or mention? Because like one of our common areas of interest is like. Not just paleontology, but the theory of knowledge behind paleontology. And uh, I mean, I must confess, you're far, far more better uh, knowledgeable about this part of the issue than I am. So any other such um, um, general assumptions that we take for granted even today, what might they be? Uh, I would have, I need to think about like...
maybe something could be about agency, like, you know, especially with Richard uh, Dawkins and like, yeah. do, do genes have agency or is it down to the individual or I don't know, is there like a kind of group? Ethic? Yeah, I, I get like one thing is that people assume that every attribute of an organism has like a, a Darwinistic purpose behind, like there, like every attribute that an animal has, has a specific function that they evolved for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. But that is not always the case, actually. Like there is this, I remember this one German researcher, I don't know his name right now, but he was like the mentor of uh, Mark McManamin, this Eddie Karen researcher. He, he, it was a German paleontologist. Seilacher, Adolf Seilacher. Yeah, I, I just now remember the name. Mm -hmm. Like he like once proved, for example, that like the color pattern on a specific snail species was not actually uh, uh, meant as a display or a signal. It was simply a product of how the this, the shell grew, mm -hmm. and that it actually had no act. Then the p pattern was just a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. And it had no function. And like sometimes uh, we underestimate maybe like how many things in ex in nature exist just because uh, nobody bothered to like uh, get rid of it or or just or, because they are not detrimental yeah, yeah because it was not detrimental or it had even if it has no function in fact i think in like uh, speculative evolution art people usually come up with a lot of mechanical solutions people usually come up with a lot of organs and features that are actually there for a purpose yeah and this is actually something that nature doesn't usually do i mean when when nature does it the products are extremely uh, like bizarre and mechanical looking and i think for example a good example could be the genitals of uh, cephalopods that they have this one extended arm or or those weird spiders with giraffe like necks that oh yeah those yeah i just saw those in your video so when that happens uh, when that happens, it's very rare and it's very beautiful. And I think one of the quirks of speculative evolution art is the ability to introduce more such, let's say, quote unquote, purposeful adaptations into a, a vast, uh, the vastness of nature, which actually has no such adaptations uh, or very few, like many things are there because there are. And uh, nature is actually very good at improvising if things go wrong. There are extreme, like there's so much redundancy in nature. But then again, it's very fun to imagine a kind of animal with, let's say, a, a teeth that goes like a corkscrew or like a big horn that helps it unlock a certain kind of food source. And I think that's a very, like, that's, very, that's the fun of it, actually. Yeah, that's like the one thing I often like clash a bit with, with uh, Bob when we do Rhinia stuff, like in... Like when I write a species profile, like I always inject sometimes like some weird little traits of the animal mm -hmm. that the in-universe author is also very confused by mm -hmm. and has like no I, because that's like true to nature. Some animals do a lot of bullshit that we, that to a human does not seem sensible, but it just happens. Yeah, and yeah. like Bob's uh, uh, issue when I do that is always, but we need to explain that somehow. And I'm like, do we? Yeah, I remember. Like, actually, a lot of that "quote unquote" bullshit uh, makes the animal and makes its image yeah. in people's minds. I used to remember, like, I was writing for Snaya that there's this one group of creatures that has black blood, and that's it. No one knows why, and things like that, you know. Or the the one that has like this big penis spike, and it, like, they cut it like for a test, they cut it off, and then it uh, turned out it actually had like higher fitness yeah 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 <laughs> i remember what was that. the name of that guy like this this, this oh, like i used to call it um i used to call it flip d-i-c-k and this is what this was one of the many Flipstick. edgy names yeah yeah but it's one of the many edgy names i also used to call it i think the mikado creature because there was a game called mikado with many yeah, yeah. but i mean today i would call it just like um uh, I would call it stick leaper or something like that. Uh, I'm I'm grown past that stage, but yeah, I mean, I used to make I, I used to make many such things with Snyad, and 
I think maybe it could be a good takeaway to our viewers that if you're making a speculative evolution creature, first, okay, make the creatures, then go back and one out of every three creatures, give it some random trait. Like, or it could something even be something very simple and poetic that maybe there's this one animal that when they see the full moon, they start making this scream that they never do otherwise. And things like this are very poetic, but yeah. they also make it very lifelike. So in, a, in like a counterintuitive way, you have to inject a bit of, inject a little chaos, inject a little fantasy and like pointlessness yeah. in order yeah, to make your world. To, yeah, yeah. Uh, like you said that with the moon, like I think to this day, we are not really sure why most insects are like attracted to light. One of the one of the great paradoxes of our yeah, that of our, and why yeah. scorpions like glow in UV light. We also have no idea yeah, about yeah. that. And like people, yeah, like people underestimate just how mysterious the world still is. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I mean, there's just so many of the and the smaller you get with all these animals, like if you start looking at like arachnids or insects, the smaller you get the world grows incredibly and like the mysteries of the world also grow. And I mean, uh, just from my Arachnids podcasts earlier this month, I, I used to notice that there's a little mites that go under the sun. And for some reason, jumping spiders never attack them. And why are they like somehow toxic or like, I don't know, just. They're, maybe they're too cute to kill. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe, I mean, in some cases it could be, but I don't know. I mean, like, aphids, you said, right? So, the, I don't know. But, like, I don't know, when humans see baby monkeys, they also don't want to hurt them because they remind us of our children. Who knows? Like, some spiders do, like, parental care. Maybe yeah, they yeah, have yeah. a sense of cuteness when you think about it. Yeah, I mean, they must have some sort of kin recognition ability and yeah. a sense of so in order to care for something, they must have something that they quote-unquote value. Of course, how these things come about with uh, like very simple, like maybe 50 neurons or something, it's just unbelievable. And it's uh, very complex in that way. What else, is, what else is on the table for you? Like how is your main area of research going, like your academic work going? Um, like my current job is... Um... Like the, the Zoological Museum is going to get a new dinosaur exhibit next year, 2023, mm -hmm. where we get um, at least four uh, full dinosaur skeletons from the Dinosaur Museum in Atal, which is a bit uh, more south of Zurich. And mm -hmm. that one was a private museum that in the 90s and still today uh, was excavating stuff at, in the Morrison Formation. Like they found Big Al, for example, mm -hmm. and Big Al too, and ma many such famous specimens. Wow. Uh, Sophie the Stegosaurus, which is now in the NHS also. Uh, NHM, not a NHS, is something different. The Natural yeah. History Museum of London, that's what I mean. Yeah. Stegosaurus in the NHS, probably, I don't know, some more millions of years before it's called up for treatment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically, like that museum is privately owned by a man named Kirby Sieber, who, mm. yes, like, he's, there is a biography of him, but it's only in German so far. But if it ever is in English, you should read it. It's very interesting, this man's must, life. Must be one of those larger than life characters. Like. Yeah, really. But yeah, basically, like, he, like he, he, he owns the museum and he own, personally owns the specimens, but because mm. he is not the youngest anymore. Mm -hmm. And because it is a lot of work of like maintaining all this stuff, like he did not want to burden his children. They also uh -huh. didn't want it. So he chose to donate those specimens to our museum, which is state owned. Oh, that's very kind of him. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, sorry. So you were saying... my, and currently what my job is for all of this is for like the upcoming exhibit to uh, like write texts about the, the, the reconstruction history of these texts. So like we are getting a, Hesperosaurus uh, skeleton. So I Ooh. have to like research how, how have a stegosaurus been reconstructed through the past. And of course, you find a lot of funny stuff that like in 1920, there was this one guy who thought that stegosaurus could use its back plates to glide 
Yeah, yeah. I've, have you seen that one? I've seen that one. I always used to think it was like an April Fool's joke or something. No, it, it, I've, I've seen the original newspaper article where it was supposed to be. It was not on April Fool's. It was like in August hmm. of 1920. Well, and the guy who, <laughs> who wrote that article was apparently uh, like a le legit guy. I think W.H. Balu, who also did a lot of illustrations for Edward Brinker Cope. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I didn't know he was for reals. I mean, I've heard of that idea, but it's just so bonkers that it just... I always use, like, if it was real, maybe the whoever who proposed it, I always assumed he was like a maybe airplane designer or something. Or maybe he saw something in common with biplanes and uh, plate I, think, planes I don't and... think he was a paleontologist, but he was a natural, uh, natural history illustrator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how he like got to illustrate a bunch of dinosaurs. And I know I've guessed the, the basic idea for why he thought it might fly is because it's a bird-hipped dinosaur. I think that was his ah, main so... It's in some way related to birds, so maybe it had some aerial capabilities and yeah. Yeah, people have these amazing um, categorical distinctions. I remember that in like, I, I, I don't remember the source, but in the 1930s or 1910s, there was this effort to connect turtles with birds, actually. I, I like, remember hearing about that in like an Aaron Ra video, but I never uh, followed up on that. But they are basically, they, they looked at a sea turtle and it was like the most like, like grade zero set theory type philosophy that they said they have if turtles have beaks birds also have beaks therefore turtles are birds and then they drew connections between um basically a sea turtles four flippers yeah. and, and a bird's wings i mean they kind of look similarly jointed but but then i remember there was illustration in which they tried to draw a sea turtle as bird-like as possible and this was like a 1920s or 1910s woodcut but basically the scales were kind of exaggerated so they looked almost feather like and the beak and the eyes were very bird like but you have to send me that if you find it again that sounds amazing i can't remember if any of our viewers remember please like comment it on the links and going back to your job now um i get this question a lot and i'm sure like you must get it too and in a way you are very lucky because you have answered it and like, if somebody is interested in speculative evolution or natural history, how should that person go about to planning his or her career? I mean, I find the solution in a very different way. I work in advertising during the days, but you have a more closely aligned career. Maybe you can have some info on how to apply for jobs. It's like a kind of a boring question, but it's actually a, something that I get asked a lot. I, I it's also a bit difficult to uh, answer that because I did not apply for this job. Uh, mm -hmm. I was found by Dennis, basically. Like he read my blog one day and so that I was nearby and asked, Hey, you want an internship? <laughs> and that's literally how it came about. So I was very lucky with that. Like, but I get like, yeah, basically, um, yeah, the bit I know how. Hmm. If that offer hadn't happened, how do you think you would have gone about planning your career, maybe in academics or? I always wanted to write my own books, mm -hmm. honestly, like not, not because academic life, it is interesting at times, but I don't think I would want to do this as like an actual full time job. Same here. Yeah, I, I'd rather want to do my own thing. So ever since I, I started my university years, I've started writing some project and then uh, like I get stalled and I get the next idea and I try that and I leave that unfinished like I have so many unfinished things I guess a good takeaway from this could be that uh, to all of our viewers that if you're interested about something write about it maybe invest a little in writing skills I mean it's actually quite simple to write but it's actually takes a quite a bit of learning for myself as well basically to write something down on paper like how to go from idea a to idea b to how to list your ideas how to form simple sentences yeah. and if you're passionate is... about something you write about it and like your example someone will read it and 
for good results, hopefully. Yeah, like like what you're saying, like my legit my blog did help me a lot with like sorting. Like I originally just started that blog because I had a lot of thoughts about paleontology history and paleo art history. And I know I just wanted, I just needed a, I don't know the English word, a ventil to let that out. A vent, if that's the word. Vent it out. Yeah, like vent it out. So I just made this blog, like, uh, like I saw, like, I, I think I got the idea while reading Mark Witten's blog. I saw, aha, uh -huh, he used this side of blog spot. Uh -huh. uh, you, anyone can make a blog on that. So I'll drop, just make my own. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and I just started writing whatever came to my mind and which fit the idea of the blog. Like the first one, the first couple of posts were like this, this thesis I had, remember, like the alien prehistoric world trope, that there was like a, mm. a close connection between like science fiction and our imagination of what alien life is like and how we have depicted dinosaurs. That was the first idea I got out. Then I, like the, the first act, really popular post I wrote was like uh, the weirdest thoughts people had about pterosaurs. And I also just wrote about that because, oh, what? There was... Uh, it was a big bird just by my window, sorry. Yeah. Like we have like uh, buzzards here around, you know, and- Actual buzzards? Yeah. Lammergeier or? Like Moise Bussar, we call them in German. I don't know what the English name is, but they're like it's hawks. Gigantic bone eating ones, are, are they? N no, that's a, that's a vulture you're thinking of. Ah, sorry. I mean, those, those also live here in Switzerland, but like further the south in the Alps, like the- Lemmergeier and stuff. But we have like these like hawk things and ravens. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I was writing the uh, pterosaurs yeah, that fits. Uh, like I simply read about all these like strange ideas people had about uh, pterosaurs. I think based, I think I also, uh, after reading some books by uh, Gregory S. Paul and Mark Witten, and I just wanted to sort them out into like one comprehensive thing that I could later look back at. And it so for some reason became very popular. Like the mm. the title, I think, and the, like the first few images were already captivating enough, so people kept reading. Yes, and this brings me to my next question for you, actually. And the next question I get from many people is that uh, how to be a researcher? Because in this day and age, many people younger than ourselves, um, for some reason because maybe they grown up in the smartphone era, they, there is this wrong assumption that all human knowledge is already on the internet or even already on in YouTube or Instagram. But how would you recommend, I mean, I have an answer for this myself, but I want to ask you first, how would you recommend paleo researchers or like researchers on any idea to proceed? Because one thing that's very, very unique about your writing is that it's very well researched uh, without sounding pedantic and overtly academic like uh, so that's but how do you go like how what is your research cycle like do you randomly find something and then dig more about, around it or do you like systematically research an area and branch outwards or something else like I, like the most basic tip I can give anyone is to learn how uh referencing works and how to read a bibliography because yeah that because then you can just based of one book uh, like build up um basically a network of references if, if you understand aha this guy is quoting this guy then you go to the bibliography and you see aha this was published here and there and then you basically can look up anyone's mm -hmm. claims that way I also think it's a very good practice to like, if any of you want viewers want to become like science writers or just want to be like bloggers or something, always to keep like, if you're interested in something, for example, just uh, for me, maybe it's about like snakes in Turkish literature and you randomly read books like for a summer vacation or whatever. If you see something that interests your mind, write that down, like keep a little notebook and write that interesting thing down with the source, with the page number, and then categorize them, these. So maybe you have some references about pterosaur evolution or like snakes in Turkish literature, or I don't know, some like 
weird legends from uh, Swiss mountains or something. Like, and I think like old school reading is always a very good, uh, like, because it keeps your mind sharp and you keep acquiring new information. And like our minds, we think linearly, but when we read things, like we are exposed to that writer's point of view and always opens up new, like, so I, it's, I think it's called blind research in academic circles, but it's very important. Yeah. Also a very good idea, I think, I, when, when I used to go to vacations in Italy or something, you know, it's a, a nice seaside holiday. One day I would take off and every little town in Italy has a public library, go there. And I don't know how to read Italian, but I would just look at these like local books. Like, there's an amazing wealth of information in any language that's just sitting in libraries waiting to be digitized. And when you're in a library, you're also researching blind, like something catches your eye on the shelf and then you discover a new angle that you never had thought before. So I, that happens to me sometimes. Like I remember I, like there is this one book I am trying to write about like fossils of Switzerland, mm -hmm. like little project for myself. And I had to look up some, um, a 1980s paper about uh, a fossil site in, in the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. Mirani, which is from the Carboniferous, because that was like the closest reference I could find to like tetrapods that from this time and the general area. And there, it, it was nowhere online. So I went, of course, to the Central Bibliothek, the Central Library in Zurich. And the, when I do stuff like that, I, of course, go directly to the book. But on the way, I always see like some like we all from the corner of my eye, like some interesting books. And sometimes I just take like a screenshot with my phone of the cover and like the number and stuff so I can find them later. Mm -hmm. I found some really fascinating stuff that were like, like a 1980s book about the geography of the moon. Oh. Which, is, which might be a good segue into like the, the next topic. Whoa. Well, unbelievable. Wow. So this is Johannes Kepler's yeah. uh, vi vision of the world and space. That's what we originally want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our plan was that, but... <laughs> but no, it's... It... We diverged into uh, many random errors and it's uh, many random areas. I mean, that's and... the fun part about podcasting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So now, actually, it's been an hour and uh, a really like loud and disturbing kind of trap music started in the background i don't hear it you don't hear it okay no it's fine for me so yeah, yeah maybe maybe let's call the last 15 minutes of this interview and then we can come back uh, or or we can just go go on and go onwards i mean johannes kepler i know uh, i did an in, uh, illustration about his works yeah i have I'm... it wait i have it right here by me all right I yep. hope I hope none of our viewers are uh, exposing themselves to this infernal trap music in the background. I hope you can't hear it. Mm, I I barely hear it. Really cranking up the bass here. But anyways, okay. So you're reflecting it on the screen now. Yeah, it's or... like on, it's on my iPad. Ooh, unbelievable. So yes, this was our one of our common areas of interest. Basically. Uh, I was just looking at Kepler's uh, view of space and alien evolution. And it was during the COVID lockdowns. So my wife and I, we were like viewing the entire uh, Studio Ghibli animation series. So like every night there was Ponyo or Totoro or uh, Pompoko, which is one of the greatest. So yeah, I, I wanted to create too. a kind of uh, Miyazaki-esque fantasy. But, you know, I mean, I mean, what are you going to do? Just like some creatures on an airplane or something? So I had this Kepler book in the corner of my mind. Okay, so and I'm going to give it the uh, honorary Studio Ghibli treatment. So if you show it to the camera now, that's why the colors are uh, very bright. I actually shamelessly like used the on Photoshop, you use the eyedropper tool to steal the colors of the skies and steal the colors of the seas and the reds and the landscapes from some screenshots. But then I, I made the thing. And I mean, you actually read uh, Kepler's work from start to finish. 
Whereas yeah. I only used some references I could find. It is like it is actually like the actual story part of the book is stupidly short. Like wait, mm. I'm holding it right now. Uh, 26 pages. Oh. Like yeah, that, that like but here's the caveat. Mm -hmm. There's like an additional uh yeah, 80 pages of uh, annotations. Anna, for just those 26 pages. Yeah, like like almost every sentence has like an annotation where Kepler explains, I describe it this way and that way because of this research I have done. Ah. Which is, but should I tell the people that are listening what the book is about first? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Let's go with an introduction there. So the, the, the book is called Zomnium, mm -hmm. or which means sleep or the dream. Mm -hmm. And it is written by Johannes Kepler, a famous German astronomer and astrologer. It needs to be mentioned back back in that those days. In I just ordered a little tea, but do go on. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, like it should be mentioned that back in those days, like we're talking about the early 17th century, um, astronomy and astrology were basically the same thing. Like yeah, people yeah. were not studying the sky purely out of like scientific research. But mm -hmm. because they hope that if they can um, correctly predict the motions of the planets and the stars, they could maybe also predict other things about the future. Acts of the kings. And I think also alchemy was a big part yeah. of that. Like too. Kepler actually was the, the, the court astrologer of the German emperor at, for some time mm -hmm. when he was in Prague. So like, uh, like many of our viewers might find it surprising, but a lot of science actually evolved out of anti-science. And I think it's also one of our common interests to like chart the evolution of the scientific uh, progress as well, scientific knowledge as well. So yeah. I, I read this Levania and he pre predicts, he, he thinks the moon is a very like protean changing realm. There are like one one hour, there are these oceans and seas. And the next hour, it's frozen. Yeah. Next like, hour, it's boiling. Let me, let, me, let me go on more a bit. Please, please do. Yeah. So the book was originally written uh, in 1608, I believe. But it was only published four years after Kepler's death by his son for mm -hmm. probably par very particular reasons. Mm -hmm. So basically, Kepler was writing this. We, we need to go actually a lot further back than Kepler. We, we need to go to, back to like the Copernican revolution to really explain the full context really. So like for the majority of like late antiquity and the middle ages, people believed in the Ptolemaic model of the, of the universe, which was not just geocentric. So like earth was not just in the center of the universe, but earth was basically the whole material world because it was uh -huh. thought that the earth was encased in multiple crystal spheres. Like that idea goes all the way back to Aristotle. Like in like, I think seven to like 24 crystal spheres and which are made of a material called ether. Mm -hmm. And the planets are not physical objects like the earth, but simply were like uh, stickers made on like plastered onto these shells that like yeah, yeah, yeah. around the earth. So like for most, like um, for most of that time people did not think of the moon or mars or venus as objects that one could potentially walk on while you still can ah, walk so on they the were just park. like things up on the ceiling yeah basically that was the idea like fascinating there was, there was this idea that beyond the sphere of the moon there the world was perfect that was where like god or like mm -hmm. angelic mm -hmm. beings lived and that, that was the unchanging world. Like the, all the motions are like in perfect, like everything is in perfect motion and new things cannot appear there and stuff. Were the stars all on the same crystal sphere or did they have I, multiple? I believe they were all on, this, on the last sphere. I think that was the general belief. That actually makes perfect sense from their point of view because yeah, like that is how the would thing. you... The thing is the Ptolemaic model was so like long lived because you could accurately predict things with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah. of course, uh, up and of course, like once like um, the instruments improved and people found out, wait, this does not add, like our observations do not add up with this model anymore. 
Like mm-hmm. that's when like Copernicus and Galileo came mm-hmm. and like changed it around to the heliocentric model. And Can I just mention a, a little parenthesis about the science fiction story with a similar premise? It's called uh, Crystal Spheres by David Brin. That's B-R-I-N. And in this story, uh, they launched this faster than light ship. Suddenly, the entire area of stars around the Earth shatters because turns out the last crystal sphere was real. So they actually spent uh, centuries trying to destroy these meteors that resulted from the smashing of the last celestial sphere. And when they defeat them, they actually realize this was like a test, a built-in test of intelligence. Because if you m- manage in this story, it's faster than light speed. If you shatter the sphere, and if you manage to combat the asteroids, then you are cleared as a galactic intelligence species to join the Federation of Spacefaring Galactic Species. There is a very nice. similar book by Terry Pratchett. It's called Sprata, where it's about like this alien race that builds like fake planets with like fake uh, geologic histories so of the people who are, are eventually placed on the planet will believe they evolved naturally. And at some point in the story, they find this weird ball in space and they go inside and it's a flat earth with mm-hmm. like a geography reminiscent of like these medieval maps. And wow. like the, and like it's strongly implied the people there like are later evacuated to like a replica of our modern earth. And it's like implied. So like all those maps, all those like star models and stuff were real at some point. They were just living on a different planet. <laughs> But th- those are very good, very good. There's, I think, an entire genre of like alternative, let's say, not speculative evolution, but speculative physics like that. Yeah, cos- yeah alternative cosmology, I think, is the best term. There was also another book about, um, ah, the name eludes me, but it was about what, what if the Ptolemaic view of the universe was correct? And basically, they go, like, it's set in the present day, but ancient Greek civilization has survived until the present day. But all the physics are like Ptolemaic physics. So actually yeah, they I have... remember like... you, talk, you, you talked about this one in like one of your previous videos, I remember. Yes, yes. And, but they, now... and they perform space travel by simply putting a piece of the moon on their ship because it's lighter than everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It floats. It was unbelievable. And they had like spontaneous generation as a science. So basically they just leave some hay and like mix it with sweat or something to create a little baby sheep, which they then uh, like slaughter and eat on the spaceship. It was very, they also had these like uh, anti-parabolic trajectories because in those days, people used to think that physics, if you like shoot a gun from here, it goes here. And if it runs off out of energy, it drops it's like like a yeah. direct saw to triangle. So they have weapons that fire that way, actually. It's basically combining like a, a hovitzer and a mortar and you, you can't hide behind the defilade it was like fun but anyways yeah. going back to your uh, narrative of the Copernican yeah, the, revolution of course there was uh, like like growing like uh, once the renaissance and the early modern period started there was like growing doubts about this model with uh, Giordano Bruno Copernicus Galileo and stuff and of course they promoted the, this geocentric, no, but technically, and um, Giordano Bruno did not actually pro- kind of promote a geocentric model, but f- was firmly of the opinion that there was no single center of the universe. Mm. So he already had quite a modern view that way. But that was I mean, of course, more radical. Days. Yeah, yeah. The ballsy move, I mean, in those days. Yeah. Like, the pe- yeah, like uh, Giordano Bruno. Uh, People kind of sometimes underestimate why he was put to the stake. It was not just because he said the earth does not revolve, uh, the sun does not revolve around the earth, but he also said some religious things that were quite heretical at the time. Like I think he promoted a view of pantheism that uh, simply Ah. was not in line with uh, the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But I think we will get back to Bruno later. So basically, of course, like Copernicus. uh, proposed his idea of heliocentrism. Uh-huh. He himself also had some problems with that model because Copernicus still assumed 
that uh, all the motions uh, of the planets are so perfectly circular. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like the, the, the moon and, and um, sorry, the earth and Mars and Venus like revolve around the sun in like perfect circles, which does not quite add, add up if you like, for example, uh, track the movement of Mars across the sky. You see it sometimes uh, goes yeah, it's in not a perfect circle. And it completely goes back and then it goes further again. Uh, did, they, did they come up with an intermediate, like not crystal yeah, yeah. spheres, but bouncy ball spheres, basically? That's no, no, like uh, similar. They they created something called epicycles. So ah. the so the planets move around the sun, and on their orbit, they also revolve around an invisible point. So it's like ah, an okay, is in an orbit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the the way they fixed it back then, and. Kepler's major contribution to all of astronomy to this very day are, of course, his Keplerian uh, laws. Uh -huh. and the basic premise is that the, the, the planets do not revolve around objects in perfect circles, but in ellipses, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. simplest way with which you can actually uh, explain these motions across the sky. So before Kepler, no one they had thought about the inhabitants of these spheres or like... That is not true. That oh. is. Then the idea, like the idea of heliocentrism goes actually farther back to, farther back than Copernicus. Like the, the ancient Greeks were already thinking about stuff like, like, like that. Like um, Aristarchus of Samos, like mm. an, from ancient Greece, I think like 300 BC. Um, he already proposed that the sun revolves around, uh, that the earth revolves around the sun. Uh huh. Yeah. But did any of these people imagine like the inhabitants of other spheres or like, like things living on the sun or something like that? There is one novel by Lucian of Samosata. He was a Syrian ah. living in Samsat, which is today uh, Turkey. Uh huh. Yeah, like he wrote a. Uh, Vera Historia, which I think today is mostly translated as true story or true history. Ah, is it the one about the ship that gets yeah. caught in a yeah. water sprout? Exactly. Or a it's about like a, a cruise similar to the Odyssey and there is like a giant storm that picks up the ship and throws it into space. Hmm. And from space they sail to the moon where they ah. like a, a race of aliens that is like all male members and they reproduced by fucking each other in the knee oh my god yeah <laughs> and they go to war with people on the sun uh -huh. by having spiders uh, weave a net between the sun and the moon and then they walk across the net the more i the more i learn about these stories it seems that there was like a genre of these and uh, there must have been so many like crazy uh uh, kneecap shagging, spider riding, uh, tornado dwelling, science yeah, fiction that tales. Is, there is a that reason, must have been lost. There is a reason why, why that is because Lucian was not uh, for real. Like ah. he, what he was writing was satire, actually. Yeah, like, yeah. He was actually like there were apparently were many novels at the time, according to him, mm. and that claimed to be like this, but also claimed to be real or be, to be a real ancient myth. And basically, what Lucian was, uh, he called the, the he called the novel true story because in uh -huh. the first sentence it is truthful about the fact that it's all made up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he wrote the point he was trying to make is any asshole can write down whatever they want into a book and then claim it to be like an authentic myth that uh -huh. maybe is true, you know, and then like sell it that way. And what he is basically writing is like the most ridiculous things he could come up with to mm. illustrate that fact and in a way it's similar to those crazy american newspapers national inquirer and all that like where yeah, they says bat baby gives birth to a six-headed spider child or like yeah, but lucian was explicitly trying to teach his readers something about mm. uh, credibility and not being the thing but yeah but this but the thing is what this probably tells us is that he probably did not actually believe that interstellar travel mm -hmm. was possible or that that there were people on the moon especially I, since around his time the ptolemaic model was already developing like Ptolemy, mm -hmm. ptolemy lived around the same time as lucian in like in the second century ad i think 
in the last five or eight years, at least one flat earth believer must have found the story and uh, contrary to its writer's expectations, they must have said, there's the evidence, the ancients knew about it and that kind of stuff. There are still people in the US that believe in heliocentrism. And mm -hmm. other, so geocentrism. geocentrism. I, I keep yeah. mixing it up. Sorry, they believe, still believe in geocentrism. Interestingly, uh, I've, I've seen one who believes in the Tychonic model, which uh, with, with which I can think we can keep up again with Kepler because Tycho mm -hmm. Brahe was his teacher in astronomy. Ah, uh, true, true. Yeah, and Tycho's model was that uh, the 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 Earth is still the center of the universe. And the sun revolves around it, but everything else revolves around the sun. Ah, which is okay. how we try to reconcile like the, the, the observations with like the theological argument. A kind of halfway theory. Yeah. So uh, how do the contemporary believers like like what do they find in this theory? Maybe a little closer to God or I don't know. It's been a really long time since I read about the modern geocentrists, but um Someone I also should do like a genuine study about the kind of flat earth uh, lore produced in the last 10 years. Yeah. Because some of them really go through like wild uh, mental gymnastics to convince themselves of these. That, that is the thing though, like all of that lore is modern, like it made up today because already in ancient times, nobody believed anymore that the earth mm. was flat. Like you already had Erastosthenes, uh, who correct almost correctly uh, ca could calculate the circumference of the spherical true, earth. True. So I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean that I think the flat Earth lore is like an entire field of study in itself. So anyone yeah. wanting to embark on a long and arduous research trip, or maybe wanting to do a PhD, there's your uh, there's your one of your subjects cut out for you. Yeah, I bet that it, it would be a very good in, uh, research subject for anthropologists or folklorists, true. like true, because true. it tells a lot about human psychology, how people can like basically turn the whole universe into their fan fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. And also that there is these like genres of like, so some of them are like, they are trying to deceive us or some of them are like the ancients were right. Like there's areas of overlap usually, but like, when you're committing to a kind of something like the flat earth, some of them are like more like about a very contemporary form of, uh, dare I say, American ego, ego gratification, which, which is to say like, here is one man and he asks one question and he was right and that kind of thing. Whereas others are like more like occult or like uh, hidden sacred knowledge. Some of that bleeds into these like uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Like I've even seen things like the Jews are hiding the flat earth from us. Like literally every modern conspiracy theory you could think of goes somehow back to Jews. That's like the, the very mm -hmm. like, like conspiracy theories are fun when it's about like Bigfoot or aliens and stuff. But like at some point, I bet there is some Bigfoot conspiracy theory that also has something to do with Jews. Like so, like for some reason, they always like these theories always find a way to make it anti Semitic. It's a ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like there I is mean, this one, there is legit this one, like a uh, uh, UFO abductee who claimed there's two races of aliens. One is evil and has long noses, the other one is blonde and Aryan. Oh my God. Like he made aliens anti Semitic. And I'm like, <laughs> there's also alien Aryans and alien. Oh yeah, my. like they're, they're, yeah, there, that is actually some that is actually a significant part of like this modern UFO folklore that there's like these Nordic aliens. Yeah, yeah, true, true. I mean, George Adamski was the first to suggest these like really blonde. Yeah. But uh, I think there he, were like he, I think oh, he was the one who also proposed that there's these long nosed aliens. Was it Adamski? I, think I don't he, know. He, did, he, he invented Jewish aliens. Yeah, I think so. I remember like uh, I mean, based on my sketchy readings of this UFO lore. Before, like the gray aliens became popular, the best way to imagine aliens was these like Nordic, uh, like angelic things, because because there was no other template for alien creatures, or like they saw them as like ascended people, basically. Yeah. Which they were also like to me as a child, I was reading a lot of UFO magazines and stuff. 
they were scarier than the gray aliens because a gray alien to me was like okay a monster basically but something who's like uncannily human with like yeah. extremely bright and uh, there, there was... is one thing worse than a monster and it's a racist <laughs> oh, oh it's very very true i mean i used to uh i used to be like more lenient about these flat earthers and stuff especially like uh before let's say 2018 2020 but towards 2020 i, I would say okay let live and let live you know these are like just these normal yeah. quirky guys you know they have their... not hurting anyone but then they suddenly and rhizomically metamorphosed into the QAnon movement so fast that it was like yeah. this kind of like a threshold of polarization had been crossed and I was like whoa okay okay maybe live and let live but also uh, preach what you know is right you know yeah. but that's a whole other area of popular culture and of course the 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 stresses the the stresses societies are laboring under today with the old wars and currency crises and also it really doesn't help that some conspiracies are true so like the coup attempt in turkey or like the whole epstein debacle in the united states yeah. so like you can never be all so sure so yikes in that way yeah <laughs> so i guess every topic we got to okay okay we got to the heavy area but yeah. any any it's we've been talking close to two hours now but any closing remarks you want to make on any closing remar uh, remarks or recommendations with kepler or our areas I, of study i don't know i feel like we need to make uh, parts two sometime definitely i mean this has not been enough and thank you so much for your time and your patience and thanks to everyone who's viewing and please, if you liked uh, this chat, uh, support um, Timur's channels and Timur's Patreon. I mean, uh, you're supporting me too, and that's really appreciated. Please also consider supporting Timur's uh, page. And please uh, take a look at his blog. I think you got enough down, like if you do a good editing, like if you edit your blog, it could make a really nice science, uh, popular science book as it is now. So much okay. respect and much thanks uh, from my side and thank you for your time once again and any other closing points closing comments uh yesterday i watched the rest world dominion in the cinema ah and it definitely was a better series finale than rise of skywalker oh oh yes that kind of uh, crap is hard to match. I mean, yeah, yeah I know it, it doesn't Wars. sound like a compliment now that I think about it. But like, what I mean, and it's the movie. I like the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I'm gonna see Jurassic World tomorrow, maybe, and um, or Jurassic. What's it called? Jurassic Domin World Dominion. Dominion. Yes, yes. The uh, which is actually like the name is unsettlingly close to the domination, which is you know this extremely strange uh, alternative history book by uh, S.M. Sterling. It's about basically everything goes as wrong as it can in the past 200 years. And the group of super racist South Africaners end up dominating the planet with nuclear weapons and spaceships and- I think I, I, think I remember hearing about- Draka like, domination. Like what was alter like this YouTube channel, alternate alternative history how he made like a free part video where he looked at like the old history iceberg i think he yeah yeah, he yeah. Did one at some point oh man so from uh jurassic world to the dracas we have so much more we could talk about so there will be a second part in the yeah. upcoming months i promise you that and thank you so much for your time and it was a pleasure yes have a nice day and thanks you to too. you all for listening to us we can stop recording. Okay. So, uh, okay, we goodbye. shut off. Uh, yeah, yeah, goodbye. Oh. We shut off the thing and you send it to me on Google Drive and yeah. I'll post it. Okay, I will stop recording now.